Hi, I'm Peter Hill, and this is the D Word Podcast, where we talk dementia. It's always a pleasure to talk to experts in their own field. And my guest this week is Dr. Matthias Klee from the University of Luxembourg. And amongst other things, we're going to be talking about his recent paper, Socioeconomic Deprivation, Genetic Risk and Incident Dementia, which adds more evidence to the fact that there are plenty of things that can be changed to reduce the risk of developing dementia. So where did the idea for this particular area of research come from? The main idea stems from the fact that um, we've seen evidence consolidating over the past years that the socioeconomic um, situation does um, to some degree uh, associate with the individual risk of developing dementia. Um, however, there's been some ambiguity in findings when it comes to socioeconomic status on an individual or a household level versus the socioeconomic um, situation of the areas in which you reside. Um, so there has been evidence supporting the notion that if you're living in an area with the fewer socioeconomic resources, that this would alter your risk as well. Um, however, other studies found that if you're accounting for the individual situation, that this association would diminish. Um, so it has been of question if there's a unique contribution of the features of of your surrounding, or if this is um, more an aggregation of um, individual level factors that, that you can find in these areas. And so this has been really the starting point to, to see if there's a unique contribution of the, of the features of your environment. And then also we were interested in combining that with um, data about your genetics in order to um, have an estimate about what your predisposition would be to develop dementia in the first place. So we were really interested in if people would be equally affected by the um, conditions in which they reside, uh, grow up and, and age, um, or if this would be in part exacerbated or maybe limited by the underlying uh, genetic predisposition. So that was really the, the, the key motivation in the beginning. Yeah, that, um, large, large survey, a lot of people. I mean, where did the uh, participants come from in the uh, in the report? Um, so we've been um, using data from the UK Biobank study. Um, so this very large cohort, as you as you alluded to, was um, containing more than half a million participants, um, and the baseline assessments have been conducted in over twenty two assessment centres that are spread around the UK. Um, so we've been including data from Scotland, Wales, and England. Um, so a pretty good spread around the country, I'd say. Um, when, we, when we talk, you know, the, just for the listeners, this, this thing about socioeconomic factors, mm-hmm. can you kind of expand on that a little bit and tell us, you know, the kind of things you looked at? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been using measures that combine information about different indicators that you could interpret in a, under the umbrella term of socioeconomic uh, deprivation. You can think of that um, as a continuum from low deprivation to high deprivation. Um, and what goes into this score is information um, essentially relating to income of individuals, um, to the household size, um, to the question if you're owning the accommodation which you live in or if this is a rented uh, accumulation, for instance, the number of vehicles that you possess. So it's, it's mostly about, uh, material factors, um, about income, about wealth. Um, and it's using different components and then combines this information to get an overall score that she can use. And I, and I guess you also have to kind of broaden it out a little bit as well. You broaden it out and look at kind of aerial, uh, area based factors as well. Yes, yes, that's, that's true. So, uh, you could distinguish then also when you're looking at rates in the area in which you reside, for instance, unemployment rates. Um, you could also try to conceptualize socioeconomic deprivation in that sense so that you're not looking at individual level data, but you rather look into the areas in which people are living. Um, so for that study, that has been postcode level. 
Um, and then you can combine the information of the individuals that are living there in order to have an overall estimate of the socioeconomic conditions in this in this area. And uh, we, you know, when it comes to um, genetic risk, um, how did you kind of look at that? So for genetic risk, um, previous research has shown that when you're looking into late onset dementia, um, most of the indicators um, of the genetic indicators are rather common in the population and do confer a small amount of risk um, when it comes to dementia development and old age. So there hasn't really been any one-to-one relation between a genetic indicator and dementia as an outcome. So what previously has been done is um, researchers were looking in, in very large cohorts Um, in a specific type of study, which they call genome-wide association studies, um, in order to detect every component, every aspect of the genome that is associated to an increased risk of dementia. And as I said, these components usually confer very low amount of risk when they are spread around the uh, community. But what you can do then is you can aggregate the information that you have. So every indicator, even if they only um, relate to dementia risk, in a small amount, you can add this information together in order to have then a sum score um, that is quantifying your genetic risk for dementia. And you can you can aggregate this information and then have a have a score in, with a higher score indicating higher risk of dementia. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. You're in June with the D Word podcast. And I'm chatting to Dr. Matthias Cleave from the University of Luxembourg. Um, so when looking at the, the past half year, I think the situation has, has changed a lot with the uh, new approaches to medication being slowly um, incorporated in health systems. If you're looking into the U.S., we have now an FDA-approved medication. Um, And there's quite a big debate about how this will alter um, research focus. As you you say, I'm more concerned with uh, modifiable social and behavioral risk factors. And at this point in time, I do think that... um, that we do not have a cure, definitely. We're slowly um, on our way to developing disease modification. Um, But what we do see from modifiable risk factors research is that no matter your underlying genetic predisposition, we do see um, a gradient from lower to higher risk depending on your lifestyle, on the socioeconomic conditions in which you reside. So before thinking about treating a disease um, that occurs then at the end of life, um, there may be a very broad benefit to the whole population if you're thinking about risk factors and um, altering these prior to something developing in old age. And it's a, it's a kind of message at the moment. You, you still talk to, you know, people and, and they still think, you know, possibly that dementia is uh, just a, a form of, of ageing. Uh, and it's kind of how do you get that message across about there are so many things you can do, um, you know, in younger life um, to actually, um, you know, give yourself a far better chance of, of not developing the condition? Yeah, that's very true. And I, I strongly believe that this is uh, one of the most um, important tasks of ours as a researcher, um, at this point in time, to point to the facts that you can actually contribute to um, and to change the picture in the general population of it being a deterministic association so that you're just born with a predisposition and then you will proceed to develop the disease or, as you say, um, that it would be just related um, to aging in general and that it would be just a consequence of aging. We do see that a lot of people are now growing older but also are longer in a very healthy state Um, and we do definitely see evidence supporting that there is um, 
a possibility to live up to a very high age without cognitive limitations. Um, and I think one of the key factors here is to point to, to research um, indicating that the way you live, uh, the way you work, the way you engage in the public is um, associated to your, to your risk, no matter what the underlying conditions are, um, and that there is a value in, in, in following out the lifestyle in order to, to change your own trajectory. Yeah, and I guess, you know, as I was saying earlier, it kind of all joins together with, um, for example, let's take diet. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, maybe a massive assumption, but I'm assuming that people in the lower socioeconomic range will find it more difficult to get fresh food. And, you know, that will have a, an impact just that one subject in itself. Yes. Um, so there has been a very recent study of uh, co-authors of, of uh, my study as well. It was uh, looking into the Mediterranean diets, so, so we were alluding to that. And, um, definitely, we see more and more um, evidence um, with lifestyle-related risk factors. And when you're looking into socioeconomic factors, you generally have a picture that, that many risk factors are combined or intertwined in these in these areas. Um, so, if you're looking into education or into income and wealth, um, you will do see a pattern of more exposure to other risk factors if you're looking into these subgroups. Um, so previous findings from colleagues uh, of mine in Luxembourg also indicate that the contribution of the risk factors to your individual risk of developing the disease may not be very different in between groups, but just that people in the different groups are exposed way more to certain conditions. And what you allude to is, is, is absolutely correct. I strongly... Um, believe that following a healthy lifestyle is bound to your own economic capabilities. Um, if you're just walking through the supermarket and are looking into which uh, foods are the pricier ones, then you generally have the impression that fresh foods are much more pricey than uh, than very fabricated foods. So that's, that's definitely an issue that, that comes into play here. Um, at the same time, there's, there's so much more related to your socioeconomic conditions. There's many things that already, um, affect your way of living very early on. Um, if you are living with fewer socioeconomic resources, you're more likely to have a lower level of education. And this may even date back to the level of education that your parents had. So aside from the things that you are able to decide for yourself, um, in the breadth of the, of the opportunities that you actually have, it may have already started very early on and then be uh, intergenerationally uh, um, determined to some extent what, what your opportunities actually are and which ways you can follow. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's really interesting. And I guess there is, you know, in terms of other factors, so much we don't know at the moment, access to green space, um, effects of air pollution, et cetera. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in those areas as well, I guess. Definitely. And I think we need to start um, thinking more about how to assess the factors that may play a role. So with many research questions, we do know very much which directions we would like to go, but we're just very limited by the amount of data that we have available. Um, and especially if you're then looking into very broad factors such as air pollution or access to green space, um, you rarely find data um, that can be linked to individuals then, and also over a longer period of time, which would be very important. And I think for air pollution, there's quite robust evidence by now that there may be a cause link. Um, with access to green space, there comes a whole another complexity because then you're um, very limited by the way you can operationalize your data. So if you're, for instance, looking into areas with US socioeconomic resources, and then you do see that there's less uh, green spaces just measured by the area that is available to, to the people, then this may be important, but it may be even more important if this is then also accessible. So is it possible for people to walk there, for instance, if they cannot drive a car anymore? Is it a safe neighborhood so that people would be more likely to go out? Or is it some uh, some, pl some place where you do not really interact with your neighbors? Um, is it a place that offers a lot of leisure activities so that you're actually motivated to go outside as well? So um, 
lately focus has been shifting also to what what researchers have been calling disamenities in order to to see which may be the barriers to the things that are actually there uh, and which may mask then the, the the effects if they come back to research in that regard. So when it comes to research, most of the times you um, you're working very niche uh, and you're working with colleagues who are very aware of the caveats and limitations of your work and who are interested in the same things. But um, me, for instance, as, an, as a researcher with an epidemiological or more public health approach, um, I'm not an economist and I'm not a political scientist. So it starts already at the point where I need input um, on how to frame these messages to the stakeholders that you, that you mentioned in order to get the message across. And at the same time, definitely communication to the public is also a thing. Because as I mentioned, we, we need to first change the attitude toward dementia as something that is inevitable and just related to aging, but something that we can actually alter to some extent. And then also in a next step, um, I don't think it's enough to provide the information that, for instance, healthy nutrition is, is beneficial for your overall health. I think this is in some cases very obvious. Um, but we need to, we need to take care of the barriers for people to follow these actions. So when it comes to costs, for instance, we need to support that. And then also, um, as a psychologist, I cannot, I cannot stress enough how large the intention behavior gap is. So even if someone knows what's good for them, um, changing behavior and developing habits um, towards a more healthy lifestyle is very challenging. And I think this is, this is a field where many different researchers from different disciplines need to come together. So from political sciences, from public health, uh, from medicine, psychology, um, to have an overall concept of how to tackle this challenge on a society level. Yeah, I think, you know, just in us speaking, we're kind of broadening the level of, uh, of people that, that need to be involved in all this. I mean, in, so just talking UK based, I mean, the, the message about heart health, I think, has got across uh, and the fact we've had TV adverts and whatever. But, um, you know, I've yet to see too much about brain health. People don't kind of associate it as a as it's strange, you know, don't associate it as a concept, really. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so researchers in the Netherlands have been um, developing risk scores for dementia, and they have been using that in research as well, and showed that a large portion of the socioeconomic risk uh, with regard to dementia is mediated by um, factors that could be associated also to cardiovascular health. Um, so again, lifestyle, physical activity, for instance. Um and I think part of the reason that this is, well, the researchers there have been promoting something um, along the lines of what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So I'd say there is some um, tries already to get this message across to the, to, the, to the general public. So for the Netherlands, at least, I'm, I'm aware of some campaigns, campaigns that are trying to do that. Um, but as I said, I think much of these problems, many of these problems are centering around stereotypical views that we have on aging so far. I think it's fairly common sense that the way you are engaging in physical activity and nutrition, that this is related to your weight and then also to cardiovascular health, you sort of see these relations quicker. Um, whereas for cognition and cognitive health, this is associations and effects that are um, happening throughout your life course. Um, so you will not see immediate effects after uh, having a dinner. Um, you will not see effects in five years and 10 years, but then after 50, 60 years. So I think the, the, the distance in between action and consequence is so large that it's much harder to get the message across. Um, especially if general mindset is that it's inevitable and that you cannot really do anything against it. So again, we as researchers are very much uh, required to, to go more into the public and to, to spread this message much more um, and also in a way in which people can actually grasp that. UK Health Radio. 
the station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. You're in tune with the D Word podcast, where we're talking about social and economic influences on dementia. Yeah, it's interesting. I picked out one sentence actually at the report, which I started thinking about, and it was that a higher socioeconomic deprivation, amongst others, is associated with higher brain age. Now, brain age is not something really that that we sort of think about again, is it? Yes, that's true. Um, so, I mean, brain age as a concept is something that has been taken up by research in order to have a measure to, to describe what's actually the difference in between your calendar age and the effects of the lifestyle and what you can see then as damage to the brain. Um, but again, this is something that has been rarely discussed in, in, in public opinions, but is, is rather an academic, uh, uh, academic discussion at that point that's used for research, but it's not very well communicated there. Yeah, and I, th- I think in terms of public perception, I mean, you know, you get little brain computer games, don't you, that kind of give you, uh, oh, your brain age is, is whatever. And I guess it's a, it's an area to be worked on to kind of um, get things across. Because I think, you know, you've got a really difficult job, haven't you? You're dealing in quite complex things, but you have to pick them apart and get the message across in a way that the public will understand, which is, a, you know, is a really tough job. Yes, definitely. And I think we need also to be very careful about um, dementia as a topic being um, very often related to, to personal fears. So if you start to talk about diseases like dementia, many people do have relations to people that are affected. Um, maybe no people in their environment or in their family that have been affected by the disease. So if you're talking about it, it's it's very important from a psychological perspective to convey information, but at the same time to not raise fear or reactance too much um, in order to empower people, actually, not scare them away, but um, provide them with information that they can use as a motivation, uh, not to scare them away with it. Yeah, and I guess if, you know, if you're looking at a broad level involving different cultures, different countries, et cetera, um, everybody's at a different starting point to, to doing that, I guess. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, we do see um, some global trends. We do see trends that are happening in some countries, but not in others. Um, so one thing we see globally is that population is generally aging that is that is something that can be seen all across the board but at the same time it it seems to be the case that in higher income countries the um, amount of people at specific ages that are developing the disease seems to be declining Um, this is not happening in low and middle income countries and this is for me as a researcher an opportunity to look into factors that may be causing these differential um, developments. So it may be worthwhile looking into what has changed in higher income countries, what didn't in lower and middle income countries, in order to observe which may be the next steps in order to to get a hold of these numbers um, also in other conditions in other countries. Yeah, you know, I've gone through the report. I'm not a scientist, but I see, you know, it opens up a lot of thought in terms of, for me anyway. (laughs) Uh, a lot of subject areas. I mean, what's the general reaction been to it? The general feedback that I got was um, that it's very valuable to have something that was sort of in the mind of researchers dealing with these factors prior already um, to have that established right now. So to actually see that in a very comprehensive setting with a very high number of cases um, to actually see the benefits um, on paper. It is, however, a sensitive subject. So whenever you're talking about um, socioeconomic conditions, um, you need to be very careful to, to stress what you can say from it and what you can. Um, 
So if you're taking that up right now, um, I cannot strictly talk specific groups. I do have a continuum from lower to higher socioeconomic deprivation. Um, but this is an observational study, which is subject to bias. Um, not everyone that is living in the UK is at the same likelihood taking part in such a, uh, such a survey. So I need to be very careful then um, about communicating how generalizable this is on the bigger on the bigger picture. Um, so that's definitely something that needs to be considered. Um, time's running us to a close, sadly, but, um, you know, what's next for you then? What's, uh, what's the next step? So the next step for me is to look more into the area level indicator. Very keen um, to include more variables that may be um, acting mechanistically on the pathway from the area level deprivation to um, to dementia risk, and I'd be very interested into looking into features of the of the environment, such as walkability, for instance. I think that would be very very fruitful to look into in order to then get back to uh, to more public health uh, oriented research and to actually be able to um, point to potential solutions to altering the risk. Because I I see a huge amount of research to be done in this area in which we can point to an altered risk, but we cannot yet tell what's exactly driving the factors. And at that point, I think it's also to include more biological mechanisms um, because at the, at the given time, I, I perceive the field somehow distinguishing between social determinants of health and biological processes. And I strongly believe that there is a link in between those and I think we have much more power to communicate the importance of prevention and social determinants of health if we can link to mechanisms than that are evolving from there. Yeah, that's, I think it's a great message to uh, to finish with. It's been fascinating. Um, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, keep in contact, touch base in maybe six months and uh, just look at, you know, how this really fast-moving field is developing. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you so much. I appreciate your interest. Many thanks to Matthias for a fascinating chat. And if you want to read his latest research paper, it's called Socioeconomic Deprivation, Genetic Risk and Incident Dementia. And it's available at www.ajpmonline.org. Well, that's all for this edition. Hope you've enjoyed it and you'll join me again soon for another D-Word podcast. Mm-hmm.